Romans 11, beginning with the 25th verse. Notice what Paul writes. We'll read through the end of the chapter. Paul the Apostle, writing to the church in Rome, made up of Jews and Gentiles, he says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come out of Zion, and He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is My covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the Gospel, they, speaking of the Jews, are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of their fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word this morning. And Lord, we do seek Your understanding concerning Your Word. Teach us by Your Holy Spirit. May we be knowledgeable of your word, and also wise to be able to apply that knowledge. And Father, we seek above all to give you all the glory and all the honor because you deserve it. Everything is yours. Everything belongs to you. We give you the praise this morning from our hearts because of your goodness, because of your grace, your mercy, and your love. Thank you for loving us. Lord, continue to reveal yourself to us this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon tells us there's a season and a reason for everything under the heaven. He says there, there's a time to be born, a time to die, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, and there's a time to build up. And on and on he went. And Solomon, what he was saying there was that life is predictable. In fact, he was saying that life is boring. It's been said that the problem with life is that it's so daily. Solomon, in fact, in verse 11 of that same chapter 3, he said that God has made everything beautiful in His time. And that is so true. In God's time, everything will be beautiful. Our times might be predictable and boring, but in God's time, He makes everything beautiful and meaningful. In fact, somebody has said regarding God's timing that God is seldom early. He's never late, but He's always on time. I think it's a comfort for us Christians to know that 
God knows what time it is. He knows the times and the seasons, and we know that God is never late in fulfilling His will, in bringing His purpose to pass, in accomplishing what He wants to accomplish. And God's timing is so important. It's important for us as the children of God to wait on God's timing. In fact, the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to tell the church about four things that he didn't want them to misunderstand, that he didn't want them to be ignorant of. Two of those four things, in fact, refer to God's timing. And let me just share them with you real quickly. Paul did not want the church to be ignorant, number one, about the timing of of Israel's future. Romans chapter 11, 25. We'll look at that this morning. Paul did not want the church to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. We'll get into the spiritual gifts in fact in uh, chapter 12 of the book of Romans. We'll look at those a little bit in that chapter. And then thirdly, Paul didn't want us to be ignorant regarding the timing of Christ's return. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. And then lastly, he didn't want us to be ignorant regarding trials and suffering. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 8. And so notice with me this morning in our text, Paul seeks to explain to us this morning concerning the timing of Israel's salvation in our first point this morning. If you're taking notes, Our first point together that I want to look at with you is the concern Paul had. The concern Paul had. In verse 25 through 29, notice verse 25 again with me, what Paul writes. He says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so notice with me what Paul doesn't want us to be ignorant of is concerning this mystery. Now, the word ignorant here simply means, it's a Greek word that means to not know because of a lack of information. It's not that we can't know. It's just that we don't know because of a lack of information. Now, what don't we know? Paul speaks of this mystery. He doesn't want us to be ignorant without understanding concerning this mystery. What does the word mystery mean? It doesn't mean what we think it means. In fact, the word mystery is used 27 times in the New Testament. Many times we think it means that we have to solve something. The mystery or uh, the murder on the Orient Express. You know, who did it? Or if you ever played the game Clue, right? We're trying to find out who did it. Was it Colonel Mustard in the library using the candlestick? You know, uh, that's not what the word mystery means. In fact, What it means is something that was hidden in time past, but has now been revealed. And so God has hidden this mystery in times past, but now He's revealing it to us. What is He revealing? He's talking about here the relationship between God and the Jews. His future for the Jewish nation of Israel, even though they've rejected the gospel, they've rejected the Messiah. God is revealing to us now that He is not done with Israel. And He's revealing that to us, the Gentiles. We didn't have enough information. We lacked a proper understanding. In fact, many people still do. But Paul is concerned for us that we would have a proper understanding regarding this mystery. And so, notice the mystery that he wants us to understand and not be ignorant of. He tells us three things regarding this mystery. Number one, notice the blindness of Israel. That's what he wants us to understand this morning. Regarding the blindness of Israel, Paul, notice, he tells us that it is in part. In other words, it is only partial blindness. 
And it is also only a temporary blindness. It is a partial blindness, church. Why? Because not all Israel was blind to the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. Paul included. Paul was a Jew that found Jesus Christ. We know all of the 12 disciples were Jews. And then also the 120 in the upper room, many of them were Jews. And so all of Israel was not made blind. And all of them did not reject the Messiah. And this is why Paul is telling us that it's a partial blindness. Now, when will this blindness be lifted? And Paul tells us here, notice uh, it's a timing issue. The word until is a word that regards time. And he says that this blindness in part that has happened to Israel uh, will happen until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so this is what we want to talk about this morning. What is the fullness of the Gentiles? What does that mean? Well, most conservative Bible scholars will agree that the fullness of the Gentiles speaks of a certain number of Gentiles that God has in His mind that will get saved before the rapture of the church occurs. And so there's a certain number of Gentiles that will get saved. In fact, there's probably one Gentile convert on this globe, the planet Earth, that needs to get saved, that God knows, you know, as soon as that Gentile gets saved, it's going to trigger the rapture of the church. In fact, you could read regarding the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, 1 Corinthians 15.51-58. And so you and I need to continue to be busy sharing the gospel with those that do not know the Lord. Because imagine if that last Gentile that needs to get saved, that's going to trigger the rapture, is in our community. The city of Fort Collins. Or maybe that person, he or she, is your co-worker. Maybe that person is here this morning. And if you are here this morning and don't know the Lord, then I want to strong you, strongly encourage you, man, will you surrender your life to the Lord? We want to go to heaven. And if you're the last Gentile that needs to get saved this morning to trigger the rapture of the church, then man, we want to encourage you to surrender your life to the Lord. In fact, one of the things that I like to do when I lead people to the Lord and, and lead them in the sinner's prayer, accepting Jesus as their Savior, is when I'm praying with them, I usually like to keep one eye closed, one eye open, just in case at the end of that prayer, you know, boom, we're, we're all gone. We disappear. And, and that's our desire is to go and be with the Lord. And we're waiting for that last Gentile to come in so that the rapture can happen. And church, as soon as the rapture occurs, it's, it also uh, begins a, another prophetic time clock which has to do with the nation of Israel. God will, will begin again to deal specifically with the nation of Israel as soon as the church is taken out of the way. In fact, before we move on, let me just explain something else that I don't want you to be confused about this morning. If you're taking notes, write down Luke chapter 21 and the 24th verse, because there Jesus says, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Not to be confused with the fullness of the Gentiles. Jesus here is speaking of the times of the Gentiles. And notice he's speaking specifically regarding the city of Jerusalem. You see, what Jesus is talking about here is he's talking about the control of the city of Jerusalem by Gentile nations. And here he says that Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, many of us believe that that has already been fulfilled. In 1967, in the Six-Day War, fought there in Israel, uh, the capture of the city of Jerusalem by Israel took place in that Six-Day War, where the nation of Israel uh, received control of the city of Jerusalem. 
And so no longer is the city of Jerusalem in totality under Gentile control. And that's what we believe the times of the Gentiles are, not to be confused with the fullness of the Gentiles, which we just talked about, two different things. One refers to uh, a number of Gentiles that will be saved before the rapture of the church. And so let's go on notice to a second concern that Paul had in verse 26 and verse 27 regarding the salvation of Israel. The salvation of Israel. And here Paul quotes from Isaiah chapter 59 and the 20th verse. Notice in verse 26 he says what? And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, and he quotes here Isaiah 59, the Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Jacob, of course, speaking of the nation of Israel. Verse 27 says, For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And so we ask the question, when will all Israel be saved? And by the way, the term all Israel speaks of the nation as a whole, the majority of the Jews in Israel. Not that every single Jew will be a believer. Just as God has always reserved a remnant, here God is speaking of a time when the majority of the people of Israel will turn to Jesus as their Messiah. When will that happen? Because right now it hasn't happened. You and I know currently that the majority of the nation of Israel and the Jews of the world are not saved. Because they have rejected the Messiah, Jesus Christ, God has temporarily put them on a shelf. And of course, the gospel was open to us, the Gentiles, and we have received salvation because of their rejection. And it's just temporary. But when will they all be saved as Paul quotes here, uh, it's a prophecy in Isaiah that refers to the second coming. When Jesus comes the second time. Because we know that when Jesus came the first time, the Jews rejected Him. And they didn't see Him as their Messiah. They're still expecting their Messiah to come. In fact, Paul in 2 Corinthians 3.14-16 through 16 tells us that the veil or the blindness will be removed in Jesus Christ. When they put their faith in Jesus Christ. You see, when that last Gentile gets saved and the church is caught up and taken away and God will turn His attention to Israel, that's when God will deal with the spiritual condition of Israel. And what is He going to do? He's going to bring His wrath, His judgment, upon a world that has rejected Jesus for the most part. Because when we're taken out of the way, who's left but those that didn't accept Jesus as their Savior? And God's going to pour out His wrath in what is called in the Bible the Great Tribulation, Revelation chapter 6 through 19. And during that time, God is going to use that judgment to wake up a nation, the nation of Israel, and to shake up a world. And at the end of that seven-year tribulation, Revelation 19 tells us that Jesus will come again in His second coming. And that's when the Jews will see Him. They will see the wounds between His hands. And Zechariah chapter 12 will be uh, fulfilled when the Jews will see Him, receive Him, and be saved. As Paul says here, all Israel will be saved. Speaking of the majority of the Jews. The Jews will be for Jesus at that time. If you have your Bibles, open up with me to Matthew's Gospel chapter 24 this morning. I want to show you something else from the lips of Jesus Himself regarding this thing that we're talking about here. Matthew's Gospel chapter 24 is a chapter that's known Uh, specifically uh, 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 called the Olivet Discourse. The term discourse means teaching. Olivet speaks of where uh, it was taught from, the Mount of Olives. And here in Matthew 24, verse 29 through 31, notice what Jesus says regarding His coming. He says there, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. And the moon will not give its light. 
The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Not gray glory, but great glory. Of course, gray glory will be coming with the Lord because in the second coming, you and I, the church will be coming back with the Lord. Uh, According to Revelation 19, we'll be riding on white horses with Him. Also, Jude verse 14 tells us that very same thing. And then notice verse 31, it says, And He, Jesus, will send His angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other, and and this church is talking about his gathering of the Jews. He's gathering the Jews. The term elect here refers to the Jews and not to the church, of course, because we're not in the great tribulation. We're coming back with the Lord in his second coming from heaven to earth. And so notice, after the tribulation, Jesus in his second coming will come and gather the elect. In fact, Uh, Zechariah tells us that one-third of the Jews will be saved during the Great Tribulation. One out of every three Jews will be saved. Of course, Revelation chapter uh, uh, 7 tells us that 144,000 Jews will be preserved. Remember, they're going to have a mark. They're going to be spared a sign. And uh, they'll be preserved. 12,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes until they'll last through the great tribulation. And Paul, another way of saying that all Israel will be saved is is from each tribe. There's going to be a remnant uh, and it's going to be a majority this time that will be saved. Well, notice thirdly in verse 28 and 29, Paul not only talks about uh, here the blindness that's going to be removed and Israel's going to be saved, but notice also the gifts to Israel in verse 28 and 29 that God has promised them. What about them? Paul says here in verse 28, concerning the gospel, they, speaking of the Jews, are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And then in verse 29, notice he says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And so notice first that Paul explains here a two-sided truth. And he tells us, first of all, that the unbelieving Jews are enemies of the gospel, right? They rejected the gospel. The second part of that truth is that it was for our sake. God used this time to open up the gospel to us so that we could be saved. And so the second part of that truth is not only were they at first enemies of the gospel. Remember, Paul himself uh, tried to persecute the Christians. And that's how he got saved when God got a hold of him on the road to Damascus. And now notice, because of their rejection, the gospel came to us. And so it was for our benefit. God used their rejection to bring in a Gentile church. Romans 11.11 tells us that they stumbled at the gospel, but it was for our salvation because the gospel came to us and we received it and we have been grafted in now together with the Jews. Now, concerning the election, notice he says there, but concerning the election, the Jews are beloved for the sake of the fathers. The term fathers there, of course, speaks of the fathers of the Jewish nation, the Hebrew nation. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were elected not because of works, but because of God's grace through their faith in God. Remember in Romans 4, uh, the Bible says that Abraham was accounted righteous because of his faith. And because of his faith, God made from Abraham this chosen people through through whom he desired to bless the whole world through whom Jesus Christ would come in the flesh. And so that is how he desired to bless the whole world. And so notice, Paul is saying here that because 
of the fathers, the Jews are beloved. And then in verse 29, he says what? That God's gifts, the blessings that he's given to Israel as a nation, the covenant, the promises that he's given to them, the calling, calling them to himself, all these things are irrevocable. In other words, God will not go back on his promise. He's going to fulfill his promises to Israel. These are everlasting promises. Man, when God called the nation of Israel, he knew that they would partially reject him, but he also knew that he would never reject them in totality. There's always been a remnant. It wasn't because of Israel's faithfulness that God has continued to be faithful to keep his promises. No, they've been unfaithful as a nation. But yet God is always faithful. Listen, your faithful unfaithfulness, my unfaithfulness, will never make God unfaithful to His promises. His, fa- His promises will always be faithful. In fact, in fact, Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.13 said, if we are faithless, He remains faithful. Man, God, God doesn't change. His Word is true. He is faithful to His Word. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that even when I'm unfaithful, God continues to remain faithful. He doesn't change. He's that same forgiving, loving, merciful, and gracious God. And we could thank God for that. We could praise Him. I mean, we might just want to burst out in song, right? And that's what we're going to find out Paul doing, in fact, at the end of this chapter, you know, regarding all these things that we're talking about here. That God, that Paul just breaks out in song, and we'll see that uh, in the end here. But notice, secondly, my second point is the comparison Paul makes, beginning with verse 30, the comparison Paul makes. He says in verse 30, notice, for as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, speaking of the disobedience of the Jews here, secondly. How many of us were once disobedient? Every hand should be shooting up in the air, right? We were once disobedient. And then when we heard the gospel, we responded to God's love for us. And we obtained mercy. The gospel came to us. Why? Because the Jews rejected it. They were disobedient. And that's what Paul is saying. He's going to compare the Jews' disobedience with our disobedience And how because of their disobedience, we were shown mercy. And we responded and left our disobedience to embrace God's mercy. Notice Paul continues the comparison in verse 31. He says, even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, the Gentiles, they also may obtain mercy. And so notice he's talking again about the Gentiles' disobedience and we were shown mercy. And because of the mercy that has been shown to us, hey, God also wants to use the blessings that we've received, remember, to cause the Jew to become jealous. And so that they might see the blessings that we've received, the mercy we've received, and respond to God's mercy. And and you know what, if we could be grafted in, remember we talked about this last week, that hey, the Jews, even though they've been cut off temporarily, they could also be grafted in again. God is always with open arms to receive his prodigal sons and daughters that will come running to him. And so that's what Paul is speaking about here, that we've been shown mercy so that the mercy that has been shown to us could draw the Jews to the mercy that's been shown to us. Man, we're instruments of mercy that God wants to use to draw others to Himself. The blessings that we receive, the joy that overflows our heart every day. Man, we just skip into work, right? And we're all excited and, and, and people ask us, man, what's, what, what drug are you on, man? I need some of that. Is it a, a Red Bull that's giving you those wings or what is it, you know? No, it's the mercy. It's the, the fact that we're children of God, that we've been forgiven. That we are our recipients of the love of God. And we have this hope in this earthen vessel that one day we're going to put off this body of sin and we're going to be given a new body in heaven 
uh, at the rapture of the church. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us in a moment in the twinkling of, eye, of an eye, we're going to all be changed. And this mortal will put on immortality. And that's our hope. And it gives us that, that love and that, that skip in our step. And, and of course, you know, it's to provoke the Jews to jealousy, uh, Romans 10.19 says. And, and you know, I firmly believe, church, that it is really the, the key element is the love of God that overflows our heart. Romans 5.5 5 says that God has poured out His love into our hearts by His Spirit. And we have responded to that love because He loved us first. 1 John 4.19 says, we love Him because He first loved us. Jesus said in John 13.35 that they will know that we're His disciples by our love for one another. And so the love of God that flows our heart is what's going to draw others to us, including and especially the Jews. And when we go to Israel together, one of the things I remember coming back with the first time that I went to Israel is I came back with a love, not just for those that I traveled with and we, you know, we knit hearts together, being on this trip, you know, on the bus together for a whole week. But I also came back with a love, not just for one another, but for the Jews and for the land of Israel and the people that God chose as His own special people. And when we go together again, one of the things you're going to recognize is that God's going to give you a love for His people. And, the, you know, uh, there's no reason that, that any one of us Christians should be considered or called an anti-Semitic, anti-Jews. Because our Savior is a Jew. And we should love the Jews because we wouldn't have a Bible without the Jews to read. And we wouldn't have this gospel that we have uh, held on to if it wasn't for the Jews. And so notice that uh, God wants to use us, church, to uh, bring the Jews back to Himself. You know, one of the things I've shared with you before that uh, I received from my Greek instructor in Bible college, Larry Powers, he used to always tell us that a Spirit-filled Christian is like a water hose. Man, you get in front of a Spirit-filled Christian and you're going to get wet with the love of Jesus. And guys, as a vessel, as a Christian, we want to be filled with the Spirit, but that feeling is to, to overflow us too. Remember in John 7 when Jesus was saying, you know, if anyone is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. And out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And then John gave us the commentary and said this he was t uh, talking about was the Holy Spirit he was talking about who hadn't yet been given because Jesus hadn't yet been glorified or gone to the cross. And so we need to let the Holy Spirit flow out of us. Notice verse 32. He says, For God has committed them all to disobedience, that He might have mercy on all. And church, I think you, you'd agree that we all at one point were all a bunch of lost sinners. But we found mercy. God found us. We were all once lost, but now we've been found, as Romans 3.23 tells us, for we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The problem was that we have all become descendants of Adam, the first man. And because Adam sinned, we all inherited that sin nature that he passed on to us. We're all part of his family, right? The Adam's family, Romans 5 tells us. That sin entered into humanity through one man, and that is through Adam's fall. And so we were all disobedient so that God could show us all mercy, and we've received mercy through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 4 tells us that God is rich in mercy. He is rich in mercy. Thank God for his mercy. Man, that's an undeserved merit, you know, an undeserved word. It's not something that we can earn His mercy. It's undeserved. We deserve death. But yet God showed us mercy. Well, this brings me to my last point this morning. Notice the conclusion that Paul draws. I told you that, man, it, it, we're talking about God and, and everything that God is and God has done and God will do, it, it would just lead 
Paul into a song. And this is what he's doing here in these last few verses of chapter 11. He just goes into a song of worship and talks about God here. And, and I want to break it up in two parts, this conclusion that Paul draws. Number one, notice in verse 33 and 34, he talks about first the mind of God. And listen to what he says in verse 33. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. And so notice the, the words wisdom and knowledge here talk about the mind of God. And Paul is talking about how deep a well of wisdom and knowledge God has so deep that it's unsearchable. And even the best search engines, you know, you could have a question about God, why He did this, why He did that, and even the best search engines will not have an answer for you. God's wisdom, God's knowledge is so deep. Now there's a difference here between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge, of course, speaks of information. Wisdom speaks of the application of that wisdom. You see, you could be the smartest guy in the room, but not the wisest guy in the room if you don't properly apply the knowledge, the information. Knowledge tells us that that's a skunk. Wisdom tells us to steer clear from that skunk, right? That's wisdom. And so that's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. And, and Paul's point here is that when God makes a judgment, when God makes a decision that is based on His knowledge and His wisdom, he's saying it comes from the deepest well. It's unsearchable. His knowledge and wisdom is so deep that it is unsearchable. Uh, and, and here's the conclusion. Listen, it's, it's unsearchable. What Paul is saying is that we will not always understand why God does certain things. And we're not always going to understand why God does certain things. Why He waits and why He wants us to wait and to be patient. God, when are you going to give us our building, right? Uh, we don't understand it. Man, we're all praying, right? We all are, right? If there's anybody that's not, you know, show yourself. No. Uh, but why, you know, we don't understand always why God does certain things. I love what J.B. Phillips says about God and his ways. He says this, listen, if God was small enough to figure out, he wouldn't be big enough to worship. Man, God is so big. His ways are so far beyond our ways. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God says through Isaiah, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Verse 34, notice he says, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? And I think we'd all agree, man, we don't know the mind of God. We don't know exactly what God is thinking and why he does certain things. As far as becoming God's counselor, hey, I think we probably all tried to counsel God at one time or another, right? God, we think you should do it this way. God, if I were you, I would do it this way, you know? And we counsel God and we, we ask God, we petition God. We want him to do it our way, but you know, God's ways are not our ways. Paul in Romans 9.20 tells us, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? And who are we to complain or to argue against God? That's an argument we could never win. And then notice lastly, not only the mind of God, but here in the last two verses we want to look at, Paul talks about the things of God. The things of God. Verse 35, notice what he says. Or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. 
The idea that Paul is making here is that we can never give anything to God because everything belongs to Him anyway. Man, He owns everything. Listen, God has need of nada. He doesn't need anything. You can't add anything to Him or subtract from Him. I love what the Lord says to us through Isaiah in chapter 66, verse 1 and 2. Listen, it says there, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? The, the idea of God being impressed by anything we could build or give to Him. He says, And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist. In other words, He created them. But then He says this, listen, But on this one will I look. The idea of being impressed. He says, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. In other words, those of us that are broken before God, we have a heart that is broken, a will that is broken. It's not my will, Lord. It's your will be done. It's your word be done. It's those that are trembling at the word of God, obedient to the word of God. Why? Because he says what? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Man, all glory should be given to God. Why? Because everything that we have, we've received from him. We, we didn't come in here you know, with everything that we have, right? We came naked into this world and we're going to leave naked. We're, we can't take anything with us. You know, that kind of puts a uh, uh, value on everything that we own, doesn't it? We can't take it with us. Man, we're, we're out here trying to earn a hard dollar and hoarding up that cash and buying things that we could never take with us into eternity. They don't last. And therefore, we should glory in God and His eternality and who He is. Why? Because He is everything. He's blessed us with all these things that we have. And so we could never, you know, uh, have God pay us back because He owns everything. God, you owe me, we often say, right? I've been coming faithfully to this church. God, you owe me. Man, he doesn't owe us anything. And we depend upon the Lord for the very breath that we have in our lungs. Even if we want to praise God because of His goodness, man, we have to depend upon Him even for the praise of our lips. Because He causes our heart to beat, you know. He gives us the very breath in our lungs. I love what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 24, verse 1. He said, The earth is the Lord's, and all its fullness, the world, and those who dwell therein. That it, that's us. We dwell on this world. 1 Corinthians six nineteen. Hey, Paul tells us that we're not even our own. We belong to God. He's purchased us. And so we belong to Him. And the quicker we understand that, church, the quicker it's going to be that we, that we constantly give glory to God for everything that we are, everything that we have that He's blessed us with. The quicker that we understand that He deserves all the glory and we become vessels that live for His glory, not our own glory, not vain glory, but His glory. Somebody said regarding an individual, a great servant of God in the 17th century, a fellow by the name of Blaise Pascal. He taught that what the mind cannot know, the heart may know by other reasons. And you know, we can't understand everything in our mind about God. But guys, I think you'd agree with me that in our hearts, we could know God. We could give Him praise because of His goodness, because of His grace, because of His mercy. Man, we might not understand everything about God, but the things that you don't understand, we should always fall back on the things that we do understand about God. Number one, that He loves us, right? 
that He saved us. That He sent His own Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us upon the cross. Man, we could understand that and, and we could give Him glory for that. Next week in chapter 12, in fact, that's how we begin, right? With our memory verse of the month. He begins with what? The word, therefore. And he says what? Therefore, we should present our bodies. He says, I, I beseech you, I beg you to present your bodies as not a dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice, a holy sacrifice to God. Not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind so that we could know and approve the will of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help us by your spirit, the helper, the enabler, the one who gives us power and strength to be a witness for you. Lord, our desire is that we would be vessels that glorify you and honor you because you deserve all the glory for all your goodness that you poured out upon us through your son, Jesus Christ, his grace, his love. Lord, your word says in Lamentations 3 that your mercies are new every morning. Father, we thank you for your mercy every morning because we fail you daily. We struggle in these bodies of flesh daily. We doubt, Father, often your word daily, your promises daily. And so we thank you, Father, for your mercy and for your patience with us, your love. We pray this morning that you would fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, enabling us, Father, to walk with you in holiness through difficult times, through hardship, Father, to give you the praise and the glory. Lord, will you turn, Father, our, our time together into a song of worship within our hearts for your goodness because of your grace, because you have forgiven us. Lord, we want to turn our lives into a song, a new song this morning because we're grateful, Lord, for all the things that you've done. And church, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and you've never asked Him to forgive you of your sin, you never asked Him to be your Savior and to be your Lord, the Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, and 10 that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And if there's anybody here this morning, maybe you've never confessed and, and, and told the Lord and believed in your heart that He died for your sins personally. If you want to do that this morning, the Bible says that He will in no wise cast out anybody that turns to Him. He'll accept you. And He will pour out His love to you and in you and through you. And this morning, before we close, we're going to sing a song, but there's going to be prayer workers here at the front. People that want to pray with you. And if you need prayer this morning, then you come. Don't leave this morning. If there's something on your heart that you need prayer for, if, if you need salvation this morning, we'd love to pray with you, inviting Jesus to be your Savior and to be your Lord. So you come. I will bow before the cross, cherish my Redeemer's cost. There is nothing I can do but only stand amazed by you and mercy Every day, wrapped up in your arms of grace, nothing more.